We're talking about fulfilling psychological needs. That's the subject for today. I want you to picture two scenarios. Uh, so, someone is taking a test, and in the middle of the test, he signals to the person who's supervising that he needs uh, special help because he's suffering from a migraine headache, and he just, he just can't continue to do the test. So it's likely that um, he'll, he'll get a dispensation, maybe they'll delay the test for him a half a week and take it with different questions or something because something like a migraine headache is just uh, sort of overwhelming uh, disability that makes it impossible to do well on a test. Now picture the same student who have it through the test, calls for the proctor and says, Tell you the truth, I have, a t I have a terrible problem uh, doing this test because it's just so boring. It's just so crashingly boring. I can't, I can't focus on it. I, just, I can't pay attention to it. You know. How much medieval French poetry can you take, after all? <laughs> and I did one study that. Um, so I think people will not be sympathetic, and they'll say, boring? Get hold of yourself! The race is not to the weak and to the lazy. No, so that's boring. Just power through it. What are you talking about? Boring is not an excuse. A headache is an excuse. But boring is an excuse. Why not? Why not? Headaches can be somewhat severe or mild. Boredom can be mild or severe. I think the inherent underlying prejudice here is the difference between physical symptoms and psychological symptoms. Physical symptoms we take seriously. We think of them as real obstacles. And psychological symptoms we take as if they're uh, just made up or exaggerated or it's part of being a mature adult to overcome your psychological state and do what needs to be done. I think it's totally indefensible in, in common sense terms, in realistic terms, and it is very refreshing that Torah sources do not tolerate this kind of distinction between physical needs and psychological needs. They're treated strictly on a par. The question will be how severe is the need and what are the consequences of, of, of ignoring the need, but to classify and say the physical is somehow more real, more significant than the psychological, the Torah sources don't do that. I'll give you a few examples. Um, the Gemara talks about our responsibilities to give charity. And there are two verses, and they are a playoff. Yes, you must satisfy people's genuine needs, but no, you shouldn't promote them into a position of luxury um, just to satisfy their legitimate needs. And then the Gemara says, legitimate means, in some cases, might include having a horse to ride on and a servant to go before him to announce his presence. I say, what? Legitimate needs? To have a horse and a servant? I mean, you're talking about 2,000 years ago. That was the upper upper. I think you call that a basic human need. And the Gemara answers, when you're talking about a person who grew up in luxurious circumstances, and now the family has fallen on hard times, and he feels depressed, he feels deprived, he feels sad, he feels dispirited, spend charity money on a horse and a servant. Now, given the prejudice point of view that I sketched at the beginning, I think I would hear expect someone to say, snap out of it! So you grew up with more, with more luxury, but now you don't have it. Adjust! Adapt! More didn't say that. More said that charity money, just as it is spent on physical necessities, can be spent also on psychological necessities. That's one example. 
Another example, you know, Shabbos talks about the appropriateness of a man having a operation on his face. And there's some question if he does it for beauty, then he's imitating the way women are, and, and men shouldn't imitate women's ways, and women shouldn't imitate men's ways. The Gemara says, if this item on his face gives him tsar, which means pain, then he can have the operation. So Tysus asks, when the Gemara says tsar, does it include embarrassment? Is that kind of tsar included as a justification for having the operation? And Tysus says, yes, of course. Embarrassment is pain. What difference does it mean whether it's a stabbing sensation or whether you're embarrassed? Pain is pain. And psychological pain is pain. There's <coughs> another example in the Shmona Prakim of the Rambam, his introduction to Pirkei Avos in the ch- fifth chapter. He makes a comparison by juxtaposing two cases. There, the subject of the, cha- uh, the chapter is all your actions should be for the sake of heaven. All of them should be in service of God. And he says that uh, how will such a person eat? Well, he eat what's healthful, whether he enjoys it or not, which means to say, if he enjoys it, that's okay. He's not against enjoyment. But the criterion for what you eat is that it should be healthful. Unless he is losing his appetite, in which case, he's not, and he's not getting appropriate nutrition, in which case you should hire chefs to make him the most tantalizing, most attractive food, which will provide maximum pleasure so as to reawaken his interest in, in uh, uh, reawaken his ap- ap- appetite, interest in food, so that he will eat enough to get adequate nutrition. And then, the next sentence, he says, there are certain types of what's translated in the Hebrew as moroshchora, which we would call in modern English a black mood, which could be a kind of depression or sadness or... Um, to spare, some kind of black mood. And he says that the way in which you treat that type of psychological uh, um, disability is through aesthetics, through beautiful pictures and beautiful buildings and the beauties of nature and music. Um, these are the things which help restore your psychological balance. So it's very striking that the Rambam put back to back a physical problem with a physical solution and a psychological problem with a psychological solution, back to back. And indeed, later on in the chapter, he says, someone, all of whose actions are for the sake of heaven, for the sake of serving God, will not paint golden murals on the walls, and I don't mean golden in golden color, I mean out of gold, liquid gold, nor will he sew golden threads into his clothes. And the reader says, oh, come on, we're talking about serving God. Of course not, he's not going to do that. And then the Rambam says, unless, you think, unless? You mean there might be a time when in order to serve God, you should paint golden murals on the walls and sew golden threads into your clothes? And the Rambam says, yes. If that's what's necessary to save you from depression or despair, then that's what you do to serve God. So this shows you that the Rambam is taking psychological problems, psychological needs, extremely seriously and treating them strictly on a par with physical, physical uh, problems. So what you, what you get from these sources, and there, there are others as well, of course, this is just chosen as an example, there's no systematic difference between Psychological needs are physical needs. Psychological needs are just as real and just as appropriate to, to, take, to attend to as physical needs. Now, there's an essay by one of the Tells of Rosh Hashivas. Tells was a place of Musser. Very high ideal ethical standards. The name of the essay is Palis Magal Raglecho, which is a phrase from Psalms, which means make a circle around your feet. In other words, set up a barrier, set up a boundary within which it's appropriate and outside of which it's not appropriate. Set up a boundary and a barrier. He applies this to the question 
of when is it justified to stop studying Torah. I don't mean stop and go to work or get married or, you know, I mean, it's uh, four in the afternoon and you've been learning since 9 a.m. and you took off time for lunch and a nap and now you're learning. Should you stop or shouldn't you stop? What is it that would make it justified to stop learning? Temporarily, right? For an hour, for two hours. So, of course, we have a rule, and that is that any mitzvah that only you can do, you stop learning and do the mitzvah. That's built into the very idea of, of to study Torah itself because you're supposed to study Amen Aslasos. You're studying in order to do, and if there's a mitzvah that can only be done by you and you don't do it, then it, it, it means that you've corrupted your Torah study. Fine. That's one thing. But the author of this essay goes much, much further. He says that a person should feel happy, strong, optimistic, self-confident, and joyful. How's that for descriptions of, of, uh, of, of, of emotional health? Happy, strong, optimistic, self-confident, and joyful. That's how you should feel. That's, from the Torah's point of view, psychological health, and anything you would need to stop Torah study in order to do, in order to feel that way, is a justified stopping of Torah study. Which means that this requirement to have this kind of emotional health is a mitzvah, and anything you need to do for the sake of that mitzvah, of course, nobody else can do that for you, right? You can't hire, hire somebody to go out and do it for you in the fields. It's your, it's your psychology. Then, that's a justified stopping of Torah study. Now, what kinds of things are those? And the author here echoes what the Rambam said in the Shemona Prakim and adds a couple of his own. Aesthetics, nature, relaxed conversation, not just what did you learn in the Gemara Shur today and what new moose are inside and how are you fighting the rates of Ra, but also how are you doing? What do you hear from your parents? What are you planning to do in the summertime? Just relaxed, calm conversation. And I'm glad you're all sitting down. I hope those who are watching the video are sitting down. And physical pleasure. Physical pleasure can be a necessary feature for you to have an ideal psychology. And if you stop the, the, the Torah learning in order to indulge in physical pleasure so as to achieve this ideal psychology, then your stopping a Torah study is justified. Now, um, if you want a source for the idea that physical pleasure is necessary for serving a Kodesh Baruch Hu, you could look at the first chapter of the Masil Sashorim. Wow, the path of the just, one of the foremost Muslims for him in the world. When I asked my Rabbi Zatzal, when I was first coming in, it was appropriate to study him. Musser, he said, yes. I said, which safer? He said, study Musser Sashorim because it was written al pi Kabbalah. The, ka the Moshe Khan Sato was a great Kabbalist. And there are 26 chapters in the book. Mm -hmm. 26. I seem to remember that that's an important number from somewhere, right? The numerical value of God's name. And there are 10 levels, and the 10 levels are very important because 10 is one of those numbers and so forth and so on. Okay, so he says in the first chapter the following, that a certain amount of physical pleasure is, in, is necessary to have nachas ruach and yishuv hadas. Nachas ruach means something like a pleasant spirit, a pleasant, satisfied, happy spirit. And yishuv hadas means you're able to focus your mind. So listen to what he says. He says, a certain amount of physical pleasure is necessary in order for you to have this pleasant, satisfied spirit and focused mind. And they're necessary to enable you to empty your heart of any other barriers and devote your heart to serving God. So it comes out that some physical pleasure is necessary for the right mental set so as to be able to serve God. Would mean that if it's four o'clock in the afternoon, and I remember when the, the base medrash wasn't air conditioned, and in July it was very hot, he said, I've got to have a Coke, and I can't take it. I just, I'm just 
I'm not able to, to focus. That may be right. Yes, you need a Coke. Don't choke it down and say, no, I'll be brave and, you know, I'm giving in to my desires and my Yetzirah. No, no. A certain amount of physical pleasure is necessary for these things. So stopping to study for that physical pleasure will be justified. So here, again, I think you see the enormity of the role that, that psychological needs play. Now, there's a qualification which reinforces the point. Because he, he points out, the author points out, and everybody agrees, that there is a limit beyond which you're no longer taking physical pleasure for the sake of achieving that ideal psychological state. You know, maybe you have to stop for a Coke, but you don't have to stop the three Cokes and ice cream. There's definitely a limit. How do you draw the line? That's the title of the essay, Pales Magalaglech. How do you draw the line? From his answer to that question, you see even more how seriously he takes this. He said, well, let's see. What would a really responsible person do to draw the line? Let's see. Do I need the coke or don't I need the coke? You know what? Let's keep, let's keep tabs on this. How many cokes have I had in the last two months? What was the average length in days between coke and coke? What was the average temperature and humidity on each day? How many hours sleep did I get? Um, and then you can sort of calculate, sort of calculate, you know, how big the need is, and when I took it, when I didn't take it. You know, I mean, you're really living a serious life, aren't you? You really mean this, don't you? You're not playing around. You're not fooling around. Okay, okay, so you're going to investigate. Now, let's see. You come to do the investigation. Well, investigations have, have soft points and vague points and gray areas. So do I need it? I don't need it. How do you feel now? You know, do I need it? Don't I need it? Am I cheating myself? Am I really being objective? Aren't you sort of self-doubting and, and, and a little pessimistic and worried and, and uh, sort of uh, pessimistic about getting the right answer and so forth and so on? Then the investigation to see whether you really need the physical pleasure in order to have the idea of psychological state is ruining the psychological state. The investigation is ruining the psychological state. And then he says, don't investigate, just take the coke. Don't investigate, just take the coke. And the ice cream. And the ice cream. Or a half an ice cream, whatever it is. <laughs> so when it's obvious to you that it's extra, then, you're, then you shouldn't do it. But if it isn't obvious, it's going to cost you anxiety to figure out whether it's extra or not. Don't figure, just take. This is quite remarkable. From a Baal Muslim, it's quite a remarkable position. Unexpected. Unexpected. And... Again, we're talking about psychological, psychological uh, uh, state. One wonderful illustration of this is something that I heard from my Rebbe Zatzal. Tori tells us that when Yaakov finds out that Yosef is still alive, and Yosef sent him uh, means and indications to come down to Egypt, so he comes down to Egypt and Yosef travels somewhat to meet him, and when they meet, they embrace. And then the Torah says, he wept on his neck. Yeah? Who's he? Who's who? So it's much like the Mephoshim, but I think the main view is that Joseph wept on Jacob's neck. Jacob did not weep. Now, if you think about it, that's not expected. Joseph knew that he, Joseph, was alive, right? He didn't think he was dead. Yaakov thought Joseph was dead. So he was mourning for him. And now, after 20 years of mourning, he finds out he's alive. Can you imagine the rejoicing of embracing his son who had mourned for 20 years? He wasn't crying. Only Joseph was crying. Why wasn't Jacob crying? That's a good question. The Gemara has an answer to that question. He was saying Krishna. The Shema. Twice a day, you know, Shema Yisrael, Shem Elkeinu, Shem Echad. He was saying Shema. Really? He was. Uh, why is that? Uh, I tell you, oh, it was time for the Shema. Listen, there's three hours in the morning when you say Shema. Yaakov, I assume, did not spend three hours saying Shema. Okay, okay. I'm, uh, I'm a little person. Yaakov was one of the others, but three hours not. Obviously, he chose that moment to say Shema. Why did he do that? And my rabbi says, how explained it in the when you say the Shema, you, so to speak, pledge allegiance to a Kodesh Baruch Hu. 
the way it's put in Hebrew is Kabbalah's Oma Chushamayim. You accept the yoke of heaven on your neck. You declare yourself and make yourself into a servant of Hashem. That means to say you dedicate yourself 100% to Hashem. You offer yourself to Hashem. All of yourself. Well, how much is all of yourself? Depends how much you are. The more you are, the more there is to yourself, which you offer. The less you are, the less you're offering. When Jacob mourned for Joseph 20 years and didn't have prophecy because he lost a level of simcha that's necessary, joy, necessary for prophecy, he was less. Of course he said Shema twice a day. Of course he could pledge allegiance to Kodesh Baruch Hu. But his feeling was, given the state that I'm in, I am a less of an offering because I am less. Now he thinks, Joseph's alive. When I embrace Joseph and I recover the powers that I haven't had in 20 years, I'm going to say a Shema I haven't said in 20 years. I'm going to use that recovery of power to do that mitzvah the way that mitzvah should be done. That's why he chose the Shema at that moment. What this shows you is something that's very, very crucial about our responsibility of serving the Kosh Baruch Hu. The responsibility has elements both of quantity and of quality. Hours, days, moments count, but quality counts also. And part of the quality of the performance depends upon your psychological state. So taking time, which means to say reducing quantity, in order to be able to maximize quality, may be worth it. And now, I'm going to change what I just said because vocabulary might be a little bit misleading. If what you're going to do is like Masil Shoshorim says, to take, to take some physical pleasure so as to achieve nachas ruach and yishvadas, so as to achieve the emptying of your heart, then the taking of the physical pleasure is also serving a Kosh Baruch Because serving Kosh Baruch Hu, says, again, the Ramchal, the Zerach Hashem, has two parts. One part of serving Kosh Baruch Hu is doing mitzvot. He told us to do these things. But the other part of serving a Kosh Baruch Hu is procuring the means by which you can do these things. Nowhere does it say that there's a mitzvah to earn money so as to be able to go and buy a lulav and esrog on sukkahs. But if you don't have a lulav and esrog, then you should earn money to buy it so you'll have it. And then the earning of the money is serving a Kodesh Baruch Hu. So serving a Kodesh Baruch Hu is not just mitzvahs. It's also whatever is necessary in order to be able to do the mitzvahs. This is taken from the Rambam and Hilchas Deos. So it comes out, we've said it on other occasions, that sleep can be a service for Sakosh Baruch Hu. If you sleep in order to have the strength and clarity to be able to serve a Kodesh Baruch Hu, then the sleeping is also serving a Kodesh Baruch Hu. And that means that your lifetime, if you organize your life well, your life can be 24-7, 365, serving Kodesh Baruch Hu. There's no time off. But you have to understand that sleeping is part of the service. Eating is part of the service. Rest and recreation is part of the service because it's dedicated to the ability to do mitzvahs. So, this is what um, Yaakov Avinu was, uh, uh, experienced, and this is the idea of taking time to invest in your psychological state, which means, well, let me ask, uh, I'll take your question, which means, if someone asks you, is there a mitzvah to be happy? The correct answer is no. There's a mitzvah to be joyful. That's not the same as being happy. A mitzvah is something which, how shall I say, it's something which you are commanded to do. You're not commanded to be joyful. You're commanded to serve a Kodesh Baruch Hu in the best possible way. And that's going to need happiness for a vast majority of people. It's going to need happiness to be done. So it's like saying, is there, is there a, a, a mitzvah to eat? You look at the 613 commandments, there's no mitzvah to eat. But you have to eat because otherwise you can't do the other mitzvahs. So this is a means to serving him directly and in, in performing the mitzvahs that he, that he would have us do. But it is part of the overall service of the Kodesh Baruch Hu to do it. Got a question? Uh, I was just curious, did Yosef say the Shema at any point during this embrace between Yaakov Avinu and uh, him himself? I mean, I assume he did. Yeah. We, they, they, the, the, our tradition tells us that the ancestors kept the Torah before it was given 
And he had no reason not to say it. I mean, he knew he was alive, right? Yes, he, yes. he knew everything was okay. So, And again, being on a lower level is not a reason not to say. Yes. It's only a reason to recognize yeah. that what you're doing when you're saying it is not on the highest level that, that, uh, that it could be or that it should be. Yeah. But what part of Shema could they say because it's come from commandment afterwards? Like in Moshe, and they said, for example, in Shema, and they said to Moshe, and God said to Moshe, put yourself like 600 tzitzits on the uh, corners of your clothes. No, not quite. First of all, Shema m- m- many people, many authorities hold that the, only the first sentence is the Arisa. The rest is the Rabbanan. Did they do the Rabbanan? Did they have, they didn't have five books of Moses, they would have known the history that's going to take place. So obviously they didn't have that. But these paragraphs don't have anything uh, that compromises history. There's no reason for not, not to have these three, these three paragraphs, even, even the paragraph of the census. So I don't see why there would be any problem there. Yeah. So would this imply if one is unhappy, it's not an avera? Um, let's put it this way. <coughs> being unhappy, I would say, is sort of like being ignorant. It's not an avera, but it's something you should work on. It's not a good condition to be in. And you should uh, work to, uh, to overcome it. Just like you'll work to overcome uh, ignorance or work to come overcome anger. There are things which are holding you back from serving Kodesh Baruch in the best possible way. That's why, I mean, again, the Palis Magog Lecha, the idea of stopping Torah study is a big deal in Halacha. You need a really solid reason to say, well, it's 4 o'clock and this mind goes till 7 o'clock, but I'm stopping now because I have to do X. Well, the X would be very important. And if he says you can stop it in order to invest in your psychological state, He's telling you that it's very important. Yeah. So when, when are you meant to make a judgment call for your own psychological state and when do you take the advice of a rabbi in terms of say you want to study for three hours and you now, you're studying for t- two hours and now you need to go for a walk and now you, you say to your rabbi, you know, I, I really can't do the three hours and need to go for a walk. Who, you know your psychological and internal world, you know, better, but at what point do you take your, you do take your own judgment into account and make the decision or do you listen to um, your rabbi or your rabbi? Well, I, I, you're raising a question which I think is, is a general question, and this, I often say that you don't have a general answer, it depends upon conditions and so forth and so on. But here I do think there is a general answer. Every decision requires rabbinic input. Okay. Because the Torah detect, dictates our goals, it dictates our ends, it dictates our priorities. Of course, many decisions require other experts as well because the rabbi will need the information from other experts to know what the variables are and what the consequences will be. So the classic case of this is a person who's sick and on Yom Kippur has to decide whether he should fast or should he, or he should eat. He can't go to the, doc- to the rabbi and say, should I fast or eat? The rabbi will say, how will I know? Go to a doctor and ask him, what are the likely consequences of your fasting? How much do you need to eat to stave off those consequences? Bring it to me. And I will decide on the basis of your medical condition whether you should fast or you should, or you should eat. So you, you'll need the medical expertise to fulfill the factual background. But then the Torah has to apply its values, its priorities, its guidelines to what you do under those factual conditions. And there's no decision in life which the Torah is irrelevant to. None. That's because service of a Kodesh Baruch Hu is 24-7, 365. Because it's continued, because it embraces sleeping and rest and recreation and, all the other, and, and physical pleasure. It embraces all those aspects of life. The Torah has priorities to set for, for all of them. So it comes out, the bottom line here is that just as you don't, or well, you shouldn't feel, I've actually met people who, who regret the fact they have to sleep. One third of my life I'm sleeping. My gosh, look at all the time I'm wasting not serving a Kodesh Baruch Hu. That's blasphemy. That sets up big curses. Kodesh Baruch Hu created you in needing sleep. So obviously that's what he wants you to do. No, it doesn't have to be 12 hours a night, you know, and you don't have to take sleeping pills to sleep longer and so on and so on. But to regret having to sleep, to regret having to eat, that's just a wrong philosophy. Just accept the, uh, accept the, uh, the way a Kodesh Baruch Hu made you, because that's the condition he wants you to be in. People regret having a body. That's, from our point of view, that's wild. That's wildly wrong. Kodesh Baruch Hu created a human being as a soul and a body together. That's the way he wants you to be. Don't regret it. Learn to work with it. Learn to, to, to 
re realize the potential that it has, but not to, certainly not to regret it. Even if the body is defected? Sorry, say again? Like some bodies, some people like born in healthy, so there are like certain defects. Well, uh, defects is really a relative term. I mean, we talk about Olymp Olympic champions, right? We all have very much inferior bodies to Olympic champions. But then the question is, what are you meant to be doing in life? What's your challenge in life? You're put into a situation where you're, you can meet your challenge. It's not true that everybody has the same challenge. So I mean, if, if I don't learn, Vilna Gong would learn um, 16 hours a day on a bad day. On a good day, it was 18 hours a day. I don't feel, uh, in, in, uh, I don't feel guilty or inferior that I don't learn the way the Vilna Gong learned because I wasn't given the opportunity to, uh, to, to learn that way. I wasn't given the means to learn that way. Indeed, the Rambam says in the fifth chapter of the Laws of Tshuva that because every human being has free will, he has the ability to be as big a tzaddik as Moses or as big a Russia, a wicked person as Yeroban ben Nevat. Free will gives you the ability to do that. Now, if you look the realm up there carefully, it doesn't mean you say, okay, I'm perfect today. It's a process. It describes the process, and it takes time. It may take years, but you can end up there. You can end up there because you have free will. So, Rebbe Chonav Asaman says that if he, Rebbe Chonav Asaman, worked to serve Kodesh Baruch Hu with all his strength for a thousand years, he wouldn't come up to Moses' ankles. Okay, so then what does the Rambam mean? The Rambam means that you could serve the Kodesh Baruch Hu with all your strength, just as Moses served the Kodesh Baruch Hu with all his strength. But the outcome won't be the same because he was given more strength. But you're only judged on what you did. You're not judged on what he gave you. You can't be classified as better or worse, more merit or less merit, because he gave one more strength and another less strength. Moses was brought up in the house of a, of, of a king, he was a prince. Do you expect someone who didn't have that experience to be able to do what Moses was able to do? Because Baruch Hu gerrymandered his lifetime so as to set him up to accomplish certain goals. What we have in common is the ability to galvanize our efforts. And just as he used all his efforts, so we could use all of our efforts, and then you'll sit with, the, with him on any Gan Eden. He'll be as big a tzaddik as he is. Okay, that's the, the general... Uh, now, I'll give you some examples of how people acted this out. Uh, I have an acquaintance who was at the beach in Tel Aviv, the separate beach, and he observed an older gentleman with a long white beard sitting there on a beach chair looking at the ocean. This friend of mine is an American, so he's, you know, uh, has no sense of uh, propriety and self-control and, you know, standard boorish American. So he goes over to this person, he says, I see you're here, no grandchildren, you know, you're all right, and you're just sitting on the, on the beach here. What are you doing? Why are you here? So he says, I, I know the name of the person he asked, but I'm not allowed to say it because I don't know if he would want to publicize. But there's one, a person whose name that everyone would instantly recognize. And he said, my job is to give decisions in Jewish law. He's a post -say. Making decisions in Jewish law, much of the time, you're making very fine distinctions, very nuanced definitions, extreme care to details and how details affect the other details. There's a kind of minuteness in your thinking that you're engaging in. From time to time, I come and look at the sea the expanse of the sea, the depth of the sea, the power of the sea to restore my psychological balance between the large and the small. Now, that's a very profound statement. He's using aesthetics to restore his balance of judgment because your emotions have an effect on your balance of judgment. So he's using the aesthetics of the sea to, his, to, his, to achieve that. There's a Rosh Hashiva, whom I didn't know personally, but I was told by one of his students who regularly listened to Mozart. He found that Mozart put him in a certain mood and a certain orientation that helped him think things through in a balanced way, in a, in a, in a sensitive way, and, and he used Mozart to help him. There's a letter of the Chazanish. It happens to be the letter of Lamed Hay, 
Uh, I got, by the way, a number of these sources from Zalik Puskin, who was a wonderful rov, and he, he wrote about this, this issue. I've added some of my own, but <coughs> some of them came from him. Um, in this letter, we only have the letter that the Chazanish wrote, but we can infer the letter that prompted it. He got a, st- a letter from a, a student who said, I'm coming to the end, you know, we have a, a trimester academic year, but the three sections aren't of equal length. The w- winter is the long one, and then the spring, summer is the short one, and then the one in the fall is only five weeks. He's coming to the end of the winter uh, session, and he says, I'm exhausted, and I know that we have a two-week vacation coming up, but I, I, I feel guilty about taking a vacation from learning where in the Shulchan Aruch does it say? And what's, the, what's the chapter on vacations? You know, where to take them and how, and how late to sleep in the morning and so on and so on. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of allowing myself to do this. Now, of course, I think we would say if the whole of the Jewish world does this, <laughs> you can trust that they're not all fools, they're all, not, not all wicked. But he wrote to the Chazanish, which was certainly the right thing to do. So Hashem Ish uh, writes the letter back to him. He says, no, my dear one, Yakiri, my dear one, there's no uh, transgression and there's no guilt in, in doing what you're doing. You're exhausted because Kodesh Baruch Hu created you that when you make an extreme effort, then you become exhausted. That's the way he created you. And he says, what we call nature is just the constant, repetitive aspect of Hashem's will. And what we call a miracle is the unique un, uh, events that, that Akash Baruch Hu brings about, which don't fall into patterns. But it's all His will. So it's His will that you should be tired for, for making the effort. And Ashrecha, happy are you that you made the effort learning Torah. And therefore, He says, I command you that during the next two weeks, sleep late, take trips, and uh, relax. And he says, if you have trouble uh, fulfilling my, my suggestions, come here and I'll make sure you do it. And then he says, you wrote me some Torah ideas in your letter. I'm not answering them. Because you understand that. If he answers them, he'll look for answers. and will go back and forth. And he won't take off the time. You have to do that. So taking two weeks of vacation is normal Jewish practice. If you put in a, a responsible effort over five or six months, it's responsible Jewish practice to take off because you need rest and recreation to recover. And all that is called serving a Kodesh Baruch Hu. So I, I think that um, uh, now there's another application of this which I don't know if it does apply to, to you or will apply to you or you no know, people to whom it applies, and that is caretakers. People are put in the position of being caretakers for elderly parents, for example, or unwell relatives, or children with special needs. And there's a certain psychological trap that people have to work hard to avoid, and that is no one can do for this person what I can do because I love this person. It's not only that it's my responsibility because I'm a family member, but I love this person. No one can do for this person what I can do for this person. And therefore it's a crime to hand over the care of this person to anyone else. What's the result? This person has other responsibilities as well. This person gets overloaded with responsibilities, becomes overtired, and then the quality of his service of the one he loves goes down. And now comes the downward spiral. So I'm not really doing it. And I'm not really doing it. It must be because I don't really love them or because I'm crass and, and cruel and wicked. And then, and then that makes him feel down on himself. And when he's down on himself, the quality of the care gets worse. And it's a downward, self-reinforcing spiral. What he doesn't realize is that the appropriate thing for him to do is invest in the quality of care that he can give by giving it over to somebody else from time to time so that he can rest and recreate. That's his investment in the care that he will give. It's not, it's not cheating. It's not escaping responsibility. It's living up to the responsibility. He wouldn't not eat to have another five minutes to be able to spend with the other person. So, and he wouldn't not sleep, although sometimes they do cheat themselves. 
certain amount of sleep. The, the, the idea of investing in yourself to increase the quality of care that you can give without guilt is a very important idea to have in your mind so that you don't trap yourself into a situation where you're overexhausted and your quality of care goes down, you become self, self um, um, deprecating and, and self defeating, and then that, uh, that leads to a very bad outcome. I think in, in, um, in this area, it's very important to make a distinction between, I've, I've, I've mentioned this before in different terminology, I spoke about standards and ideals. A standard is something which, if you violate, you're guilty. You've done something wrong, what you've done is bad. Ideals. If you have good ideals, you violate them all the time. An ideal is something which should be, at least at present, out of reach. That's what makes it an ideal. What you do is measure yourself by how much you grow towards the ideal. The ideal motivates you from afar. The standard motivates you from under your feet. And it's important for a person to have both standards and ideals. Now, the same thing applies to when you look at yourself. There's the real self with your strength and your weaknesses and your distractions and your, and your temptations and your inspirations and your examples. You're a, mi you're a mixed bag and you're navigating between the ups and downs all the time. And then there's the ideal self that you want to become and want to grow towards. But if you measure your performance against the ideal and set that as a standard, that's a terrible trap. Because if the ideals are really appropriate ideals, you'll always fail. Ideals are something that you're supposed to fail. Otherwise, it wouldn't be an ideal. It would be a standard. So um, when you're dealing with care of others or in general, um, you have to be realistic about who you really are and think in terms of growing towards a certain, a certain uh, higher state. People talk about music, for example. Um, should they listen to music? Should they? There are different types of music. It's not a simple one-off question. But <coughs> the question will be, how will you feel if you don't listen? And what will it do if you do in terms of its effect on your, on your performance? Many, many years ago, when I first came, about 103 years ago, um, we had a boy here who, who was into Sports Illustrated. Now, for those of you who are unfortunate enough not to know what that is, that's the world's greatest sports magazine. By far. And he got it every week, and he read it every week. And he came to me and he said, you know, I'm learning Gemara. I'm learning Shulchan Aruch. I get the Sports Illustrated. Somehow I feel it's just not worthy. It's not, not appropriate to you know, learning Yeshiva. But he said, I want to read it. So I said to him, tell me, how long does it take to read it? He said, about two hours. And how much will it bother you if you don't read it? How many hours a day will it, be, will, it, will it bother you? He said, probably about an hour a day. I said, well, then read it. You're five hours a week ahead. Right? Now, I knew that he would outgrow it. Four months later, he, can't, he canceled the subscription. But now wasn't the time to fight that battle. He grew into it automatically. The Gemara became more absorbing to him. It became more, more energizing. It became more inspiring to him to the point where what the batting average of that baseball player was it didn't, didn't interest him anymore. So you have to be, you have to have an ideal to grow towards and you have to be realistic about who you are at the time. Not everybody needs to stop at 4 o'clock and take a Coke, but if you need it, then that's right for you. And it might not be right for you next year. People aren't static with respect to this, but it can be right for you. If it's right for you, then you shouldn't deny it to yourself. Um... I want to add one last thing, which really probably deserves a share of its own, but I lived through the period of time when the great enemy of human well-being, according to the psychological profession, which I say with a certain amount of irony, was guilt. Guilt is what drags you down, guilt is what makes you lose faith in yourself, and guilt is superfluous. Guilt is uh, something that, uh, that you don't need, and that's not productive for you, and uh, a psychologist is supposed to enable you to escape guilt and work in terms of positive motivation. The whole 
blah, blah, blah. Well, I'll tell you. The ideal way to avoid guilt is to take an injection and become a squirrel. Squirrels don't feel guilt. Nor do horses. Animals in general don't feel guilt. They just do what they do. Right? If you remove guilt from your psychological uh, repertoire, you've made yourself into an animal. Guilt can be very powerfully productive. Guilt is registering the fact that I've done wrong. Of course, if guilt paralyzes you or it arises irrationally, there are children who, let's say, a t parent dies when the child is seven. The child becomes convinced that he killed his parent. How did he kill his parent? Two weeks ago, my father asked me to get a glass of water. I didn't get a glass of water, and that's why he died. I killed my father. Well, that's something you want to work with and try to rid the child of. That's completely irrational and something which can paralyze him. That's true. But not all guilt is like that. Not all guilt is like that. Some guilt is quite reasonable. If there's a way to expiate the guilt, and that's what Shuva does, then guilt becomes a positive phenomenon in life. So the same thing is true here. You can, you can tolerate guilt, and you can, and you can work to, to overcome it through the Jewish means that, are, that there are for overcoming it. And that, too, will actually improve your ability. So far from guilt um, paralyzing a person or making the person feel inferior and, and defeatist, on the contrary, <coughs> the fact that you feel guilty means you're morally alive. You're spiritually alive. You should take comfort from that. I haven't lost my standards. I haven't rationalized it away. We had a, a boy here also many, many years ago. He was here for, I guess, like six weeks or so. And then one day he said, I'm leaving. Un unexpected. He hadn't complained about anything. He's just leaving. So someone asked him why. And he said, because I'm listening to what I'm hearing here. And I'm beginning to feel that it might be true. And I don't want to change my life. So I'm getting out of here. That's what's called cognitive dissonance. You know, when what you're coming to learn as true conflicts with what you're with what you're what you're doing. He couldn't take it. He couldn't take facing the truth. That's a tragic situation. I will not predict well for his marriage. Not predict well for his work uh, work career. You know, th things have to be have to be faced. So uh, here, if a person feels guilty. That means he's facing it. He's dealing with it. First of all, he's retained his sensitivity. He hasn't rationalized it away. And second of all, he takes this as an opportunity to improve. He should feel wonderful about himself. What? Anybody makes it through life without, without making mistakes? There's no person righteous in the world. And by the way, the word Adam is in the Pasuk, even though it's skipped by many people who quote it, uh, who, who does well and doesn't. Fail. No one gets through life without failing. Okay, I bought made to fail. We know this in in in, in, in Shabbos. There's a Teshuvah there. There's also a Marsha and a, 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 a Pnei Yosef there. Um, you can, uh, a Pnei Yosef there. You can, you can look them up. At any rate, a person should feel. What a Chazal say. Ain Olam Omer to live Torah. Elad came nichshal behem. A person doesn't come to be solid on Torah unless he's tripped up by the Torah. I don't know if it goes one one. You know, you have to be tripped up on each one in order to get that one solid. Probably not. But the experience of being tripped up is part of the experience of getting solid. So the person can't say, "Oh, I'm such a failure. I got tripped up." Yeah, okay, that's the process. When I was first in yeshiva, again, ancient history, 1964. I was here for a year. I learned the Gemara. I'm so proud of it. I'm so happy with it. Anybody, I went back to university. Anybody I could talk to, I taught the Gemara and explained it to them. And after five years, I found out I had wrong shot. <laughs> the wrong shot in the Gemara. Okay, okay, I did the best that I could. And it wasn't correct. <laughs> and then, you know, <laughs> if, you, if you're broken by something like that, and the same thing is true with, with failures, with, uh, of, uh, mistaken decisions, wrong decisions, illegal decisions, there are such things. And you, you have to face them and not be overwhelmed by them and, and, and fall into... A, a, a guilt of despair. All the Hasidic and Musas for him together say that despair is the biggest enemy. I mean, Achim talks about that all the time. Also, the Yish, Yush is, 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 is terrible. But not all guilt leads to Yush. So anyway, 
This is the sources on uh, the sources that I have on psychological needs. I'll leave this here if somebody wants to see the, see what the sources are, and uh, hopefully we'll feel comfortable in attending to the psychological needs.